expectations. I'm not going to speak to you today. I'm going to talk with you about some things that I have uh, been fortunate to be involved with over the last few years, thanks to my introduction to this field by Wendell Stevens and Jim Lorenzen back in the 70s. For those of you that may uh, already have heard some of the technical background information that I sometimes start off with, uh, please forgive me for reviewing it again. But for everyone that doesn't have a background in image processing or analysis, I'm going to lay a framework so that some of the concepts are not in a scientific version, but in a dynamic human version so that you understand it. Scientific papers, peer group reviews, I don't do those. In running a company, sometimes it's great that I invented this, and Jim Delatoso invented that. Hey, we did that. The company of people that worked together a long time. Now, it's good in having a technically oriented company to have access to the tools to use for our, quote, hobbies when we're designing this gear for other people as a design firm to design it and install it or design it and build it and rent it out. But frequently, this gear, you're, if you're the builder, you're the best user of the gear, including all the people on our staff. So we're talking about computer-based image testing of the unknown. We're calling it the unknown because we don't even know if we're testing a UFO. UFO is different than unknown. It's unknown flying object, but a ghost, an angel, an interdimensional time-jumping entity. <laughs> if one of them exists, probably another one of those exists, and they all follow same rules for interdimensional time hole jumping <laughs> from life to afterlife, one place to another. I laid this fr framework out for you as a place that I view as possibilities that exist and must be part of the explanation, part of the analysis, part of the open-mindedness to let's find the best people that we can to tell us how to use this gear. Let's find uh, things that are in there that are not obvious at first, such as this skull that you're looking up the screen before. Now that we see it in a different perspective, does anyone see something different than the skull? Probably everyone sees something different than the skull. I find it a very interesting thing to um, experience artwork and imagery that have two and three and four and different aspects going on. Here the same. You know, we have a beautiful senorita and her Don Quixote. They're standing at the gates of forever. Or is it an old man? His head. Of course, that's obvious now. But when we're analyzing pictures of the unknown, what are we really trying to do? Are we trying to prove whether these pictures are real or not? Are we trying to find out more about it? Well, my perspective kind of changed from the very beginning in the 70s when uh, I was asked by Jim Lorenzen if I could develop a method for analyzing a series of 40 pictures that APRO had as part of their official photo set. Wendell Stevens subsequently asked me to get involved in the Billy Meyer case. Well, that isn't what we did. We, at that time, had measurement equipment that we rented out to rock and roll companies, broadcast video, laboratories, mining company, measurement equipment, oscilloscopes and beyond. We also had a production company that did sound and lasers, but we didn't do image processing. We did rock and roll tours. 
we had rental gear. Did I mention you don't tour in the winter? Snow, trucks, bands breaking down. Don't tour in the winter or find something else to do. So we would rent our gear out frequently to related projects, generators and lights to movie companies, uh, video projectors and field equipment to Jet Propulsion Laboratory when they were doing transmission broadcasts because we had calibration equipment related to the vendors, to the brand names that had installed that gear there at their facility. We had nothing to do with NASA or working there yet. But we had access, got involved in a little project to provide the interface a piece of measurement equipment, scientific equipment, measuring, extracting data on the Shroud of Turin for a documentary filmmaker, Socrates Ballas, who was making a documentary film. We figured out how to do that, we got involved at that, met some people from Tucson, Tucson, where it all started for me, who wanted us to repeat that process and develop a way to get computer pictures of pictures of the unknown, which were being transferred into a computer. A miracle was going on. Computer-based testing. Could we help APRO get involved with that? I said, well, okay, give me a, give me a couple of years. We're gonna investigate it. We're gonna find out what it takes to have the equipment to find out how big is it, how far away is it. That's really what you want to find out first before you say it's a flying machine from another place or it's an advanced military aircraft. How big is it? How far away is it? Is there anything unusual in it? Some of these uh, slides and images are prepared for um, other things. So jump over them if I do, forgive me. These are things about what we were doing. Village Labs on the 90s as a service bureau, selling supercomputer time over phone lines. But back to 1978 and 79. The strategy that we selected for working this project for APRO, Wendell Stevens, UFO photo archives, Yes, and Genesis 3 was to first go to conventions and trade shows and standards associations, the big ones. Society of Photo Optical Instrumentation Engineers. 10,000 people a year meeting in San Diego, all the latest measurement equipment, hardware, software, and we went there and had our way with them. We went around and found out what you could do with their equipment who were the manufacturers of photogrammetric analysis and image processing manufacturers of hardware and software. Finding the capabilities of the equipment, developing relationships with these companies so that we could find out who the primary users were of that gear, hardware and software, what they were using it for, what papers had been published about it, so that we could then develop our own method and then have access to that gear by the most appropriate means. Go in and say, we're here to test UFO pictures. Or, we're here to repair a piece of your gear and we're in, and oh, by the way, are you interested in these? Or, they're a service bureau. USC, at that time, had developed a scanner, a film drum scanner. Uh, you could buy one for about $80,000. You know, they're $40 now. Uh, for, I think it was $475 an image. It took about two hours to scan one. We spent a couple of grand there. Uh, U of A, at that time, the Optical Sciences Department, where Brad Smith was on the uh, Voyager project, had a guy down in the basement who was developing precise optical scanning heads for film. 
we went there to experiment with his gear, ended up meeting Michael Malin, who was moving to JPL, where we then went to JPL, talked to a numbers there. Malin eventually moved back to, I use initials, Michael Malin. Malin eventually moved to Arizona State University, eventually got a MacArthur grant for 300,000, eventually ran the Mars Observer Project as Richard Hoagland's enemy. He was the same guy 25 years ago, testing UFO pictures in depth, saying, no evidence of a hoax that I can find. We went to Bob Nathan at Jet Propulsion Laboratory. We went to Lawrence Lepley at US Geological Survey. We went to a number of experts in their field to have them demonstrate how they do what they do, what is their opinion, what software should we go get if we want to do it. And the strategy that we had developed was to inevitably have a group of experts that had signed non-disclosure agreements, confidentiality agreements, you don't talk about us, we won't talk about you. Hey, we're the people sneaking into their labs, it's to their benefit, of course. They agreed, they're looking over their shoulders, hoping that somebody upstairs is interested enough to let it continue. Well, unfortunately, when non-disclosures were signed and people were of a habit of living up to them, if somebody calls to inquire whether or not someone was there to test pictures let alone pictures of the paranormal. What's their answer supposed to be and usually is? No. Never heard of them. They were never here. And that happened a lot for a long time. But nonetheless, we continued. And generally speaking, the processes at the time was to use a microscope, look at the film grain, a microdensitometer to measure the density of the film the thickness of the exposure, so to say, a video camera, because that's what was going on then. Ground Saucer Watch and Bill Spaulding were the people doing computer testing by taking a photograph, holding a video camera, black and white video camera, at the right distance where it's, quote, in focus, getting it into the computer and running software that was developed for measuring cracks in metal. Cracks in metal. And it's now showing the string holding up the scale model, proof. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? I'm saying, looking at this and going, wait a minute, this guy shot a Polaroid photograph or took a print of a print and scanned it at four to 500 lines, depending, across the entire image, not per inch, across the entire image, and has that in a computer and found a string? That was believed to be the standard law of testing UFO pictures for about, you wanna tell me how long did people believe that? About 10 years that you could do that. So as we're involved in this, we're going, wait a minute, this is weird over here. These people believe things about testing and have authorities that is dangerous to believe that. Let's proceed unaffected by that because we want to know. A spectral or spectrum analyzer in film was a standard stock and trade part of examining a negative. Then, looking at red, green, blue, or cyan, yellow, magenta, if you're going to print, and having information about that. Scanners back then, difficult to get at and use, but did it whenever possible. All of it to get data, numbers, to use a computer system and apply the software and determine things about it as we developed a repeatable process over and over. 
For example, some of the things that you may not know that we did was look at the film grain. Everyone says, yeah, let's look at the film grain. That'll tell us stuff. What the hell is it telling you? Compared to what? Where's the normals? Where's the data? Well, Kodak, do they publish something that says what it means when you look at it? There are people publishing in UFO magazine, electron microscope, picture of the film grain. Doing what? You couldn't find out. We developed something. If you look at the film grain out here in between the sprockets, it's going to be different than the film grain and the patterns in there. If two images were superimposed on each other and the film grain of one batch transfers ever so minutely, it's a different pattern than here. Determining that it's a different pattern required some software that, again, we had to find that was in what was called the Library of Image Processing Software, LIPS. Inevitably, about three years into the project, we bought a number of our own systems and we're doing it ourselves. But the number of experts that we went to to analyze the pictures were essentially each using a piece of all of this or doing this part. And we were getting their opinions and providing them to other investigators, such as Wendell Stevens and APRO and others who were publishing them to an audience of rabid, mean skeptics. Skepticism is healthy. In fact, I'm a skeptic and an optimist. I'm a skeptimist. <laughs> skepticism is healthy. The boundaries are set. You don't believe it immediately without showing, show me something sensible that will allow me to hang on to this, some factual believing, knowing that the data represents a fact that we can believe is true. No, you can't do that. It's not right. They're proven to be a hoax. They're proven to be a fraud. This went on for a long time. The process that we decided to develop was to build a database of knowns based on data and test the unknown and compare the data and see if we get a match. If we get a match, it's a known. If we don't get a match, it's an unknown. For example, fingerprint databases. Millions of fingerprints out there, mathematically defined, stored with addresses and indexes in that table the fingerprint, we get an unknown guy, it's mathematically defined, a search is performed, a lookup table will find it or not find it, and if you don't get a match or if you do get a match, you know how to do it the same way every time. So finding those data tables and management systems was, remember our business, rock and roll tours, equipment, measurement equipment, etc., is not the kind of background that some manufacturers or some labs say, oh, come right in, come right in. Unless you happen to bring the Moody Blues with you in order to get pictures of Voyager for their new album and tour called Long Distance Voyager, and you can walk all over JPL, including into the labs and see your people again and come and go. It's not always that easy and sometimes you get in trouble. But you get things as best you can. What ended up happening is the things that were evolving turned it into a business for us. Image processing, image analysis, service bro became a, in fact, inevitably our entire business. But let's not linger on any of these things too long. Uh, making the database of knowns, there's a lot of things that you have to start with. You don't have to do all of them, but you do as many as you can. Or you know people who can tell you camera, lens, optic standards, film, tape standards, standards in lights, light temperature, light brightness, because imagery is all about light bouncing off of an image and creating an image that either by film <coughs> or by CCD gets into a computer system where you can analyze it, extract data out of it, look at it, do things. 
What are the standards for that? Who are the standard bearers for those? We have the camera and its media and the light. We define it as internal. In database of knowns, we define natural phenomena, aircraft models, special effects, and hoaxes as external to the system. Lens f-stop, depth of field, lens flare, density, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That's the box, the light, the image. Natural phenomena from atmospheric mist to stars. Defining a database criteria <coughs> by looking at, in the imaging databases that were of interest to us, what were the things that really made a difference? How many objects are there? Be divided into regions, but turning a picture into a stained glass window or a, a uh, paint by number kit, edges and areas inside of it, curvature to objects. Uh, how bright is it? What about the color? <clears throat> there are specific software programs and definitions to be able to get that information extracted, defined. And sometimes it's very elusive. As we discovered once we were in a service bureau in the 90s, things like shinier, brighter, more colorful, descriptions that the art director gives to the director, that gives to the engineer, that gives to us concerning rendering. We want it brighter. Well, what's brighter? What do they really mean? <coughs> Do an exercise for a moment. Um, over here, film. 16 millimeter movie film, shot on film, in a film projector, projected on that wall. Over here, film, it's been transferred to videotape, so like this, with a video projector on that wall. Let's define some differences between it. Anyone have any differences that might come to mind? Film in film, what's it look like there? Video, video projector there. Words, adjectives. Okay, on which one? Well, the, the, between the two of them, okay. Anything else? Brighter. Brighter. Contrast. Contrast? What, what's contrast? A ratio between the brightest bright to the darkest dark. Well, Whose dark is darker? Whose bright is brighter? Whose lines, whose resolution is finer? Who has more colors? Someone can look at it, and after a while, learn to be able to look and know, and be able to say. But trying to define that verbally, let alone mathematically, is elusive. And being immersed in the field is one thing, being a interested party and a dilettante in the 80s was more difficult, but we had our ways. We had Alice Cooper in the bus. <laughs> um, database standards. Individual components. There are standards that are recognized as my black, as your black, white, red, grain, media, processes, and there's various organizations that you go to. The database models that we liked back then, and has continued to evolve, fingerprints and blood. Pathology, fingerprints. Databases of knowns versus unknowns. Now, a pathologist used to have a real hard job. Look at it under a microscope, he's trying to memorize about 30,000 things it could be and look it up in a little picture book. That was a long time ago, it's gotten better. Defining it mathematically became part of the way that it was stored, as has the genome project, biometrics, you know, facial recognition. Is this a terrorist or a cook? We like that database system. <clears throat> and it was available as part of, quote, public domain through NASA's Cosmic Software Center in Georgia under a project developed at Cornell University which was used successfully. We started to hang our hat 
on that software as we got involved in finding out what the standards were. Standards. For us, it was the Audio Engineering Society, the Society of Motion Picture and Television Engineers, IEEE, and SIGGRAPH. Hey, that's a real good start. It's like some of the big ones. As time went on, we're testing pictures. It's become part of our business. We're even testifying in court as expert witnesses, as I have done personally a number of occasions over the years in murder cases, two in particular involving videotapes shot at night of a group of people, all of darker color, who jumped on a guy and killed him. Which guy killed him? Prison surveillance video. So we have days before and days after to look, but there is a lot involved in that. So the processes for handling evidence and testifying in court, I made some errors the first time or two doing it because I just didn't know. Then we got involved in joining some standards associations, in particular a, an association of forensic examiners and video forensic examiners. Follow those procedures and agree to go by the principles of ethics. What you talk about, what you don't talk about, and that it involves a lot of people. And other people have to be able to do what you did, repeated, if it's going to be evidence. So it has to be significantly documented and repeatable. Can't be a blood test that you hold up. Oh, I've done this a lot. You know, I know what I'm doing. Look, hold it up the window. Well, it looks pretty good to me. That happens all the time, even to this day, in, quote, UFO photo analysis. I can't believe how many photographs are run through the emboss filter in Photoshop and pasted as an exhibit in a magazine story as it means something. What, what does it mean? And, and it's because it looks like pictures from gradient and Laplacian and high pass and low pass and Sobel, et cetera, et cetera, filters of articles from 20, 30 years ago. Well, what did that mean? Where were the papers that I could read that someone has some normals to compare it to where they run that software and knows what it means? The measurement equipment early on was a spectrum analyzer, a waveform monitor, and a vector scope for film and video. We serviced all of that gear at that time as Mountain States Labs. Not only did we service it, we knew how to use it. So we could use it, and use it in very particular ways, particularly with video. Computers, image processing, was learning an entirely new area, and bringing in expert people, which we did. There's a lot of things involved, from the emulsion to how you define the image, and defining mathematically the film image over here and the video image over here. Looks like we have some smart people out here where it's possible that some of you might know what that means and even do it every day at work. Anyone here work in that area? Jim? Okay. Well, sometimes. Uh, even for those that work in it as an occupation, special effects, engineering, chief engineer at a television station, there's so much to know and be aware of that it takes, takes a village. It takes a lot of calling people and having a network. It takes a lot of knowing about the tools. It takes a lot of preparing materials to brief your own staff that you're bringing on to the project. If, yeah, we're going to work on rock and roll tour effects this project, over there we're doing some movie special effects, over there, in this part of the lab, we're working on an uh, airplane crash case for a court case, and at night, you, 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 and you are going to come, we're going to work on these pictures of claims of the paranormal. What are the issues? How are you doing it? Why are we running this filter? What does it mean? Well, 
some of the tools, some of the software, any of these I just go by. I don't want to spend five hours talking about this, so some of them I'll just fly by. If you see something of interest, we'll talk about it. And then answer any questions about things. Eventually you get a bunch of gear and you start to use it and you start to extract the data. Go through a sequence to digitize making the normals. We've got our standards on optics, film chemistry, the internals of the system. Now we're going to the externals, talk to special effects people, talk to, quote, public domain, so to say, software and hardware people, NASA, when possible, and have all that set up. Now, let's go shoot pictures of airplanes up in the sky, on the runway, and let's build some model airplanes and shoot those. Let's shoot pictures of cars at different distances and shoot them going down the road where there's telephone poles. Let's build some scale models of cars and shoot those. Let's build some scale models of UFOs and shoot those. So we've got column A, column B filled, column A, column B filled, data that we can compare. So we've got over here models of UFOs, column B filled, no column A. Hey, we've got a formula. If you can write a formula, fill in the blanks. Begin to know things. And we went to the science of photogrammetric analysis, which had grown out of the military, uh, gathering mathematical data out of pictures to be able to better decide what to bomb. Um, this is some of the real important things. Of course, an understanding of special effects and computer-generated imagery was real important because things were either mistake, a hoax done by using special effects techniques, or was an unknown. Just because it's an unknown doesn't mean it's a flying saucer. It means it's not in the database yet. Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not trying to get you. <laughs> An understanding of that meant talking to key special effects people, including two of the pioneers, Linwood Dunn and Wally Gentleman, Film Effects of Hollywood Company. Linwood had worked on the original King Kong. Wally Gentleman was the Doug Trumbull's teacher, mentor, John Dykstra's teacher, mentor, supervised 2001, for example, and uh, inevitably became the chief optics engineer at IMAX. We discovered what it took to make a scale model, shoot it, and get away with it. And that's going to become important because it's going to be done later in one of the cases. At this point, we had built kind of a network. We had built the ability to communicate data over sneaker net back in the 80s. It's really important to be able to get images from one computer to another. When we had our uh, mini vaxes, PDP-11 minis that could do real motion video. We thought it was really amazing that we had five megabyte drives, five megabyte hard drives in the mid 80s. And to be able to route things and have a database where you knew that it had gone here, but that this version that he had worked on was different than the, one of the same name over here with the same name on a different computer and it had been updated etc cetera, etc cetera, keeping track of all that that's even hard now you know external drives b c d e f g h i j k drives where you've got files named the same thing that are over on this one and that one and what project and which one replaces it it's a very difficult thing to do and keep track of them but fortunately we were able to have databases going for our work to be able to keep track of all of the images that we were doing that were now starting to flood in. And we get pictures of all kinds. Oh, by the way, we built that database. 
pictures of all kinds, from suspicious looking ones to military ones to uh, lights to hoaxes created on purpose by UFO investigators to see if we knew what we were doing. Uh, we never charged, by the way, not one time ever, even for gas. Bad, wrong, <laughs> bad form, bad ethics. You do not take money for testing these pictures. You know why. It took money. He was paid to do this. Even if you're interviewed on television, no money. And there's a lot involved sometimes. A lot of time. Sometimes you can do a, a picture in a mere, a mere 50 hours. Filters, good filters that are extracting out information, analyzing, can take a minute, two, three, five, ten minutes, an hour per filter. Video, 30 frames a second, got two minutes of this. How much of it do you have to test to compare one frame to the next to the next to be able to make a statement, to make a determination? Before someone says, you didn't do that, correct, you should have done that, that's wrong. For example, uh, lights in the sky, bright lights in the sky, wiggling and moving around. You've got to go out there with a flashlight in the dark and move it with the shutter open and wave a cigarette around like that, have a camera open, moving it around, and do a lot of those to be able to say this is what happens when it's a long exposure with a light and is the camera moving or is the object moving and what does that look like and the leading edge and the trailing edge and a bright light of an object behind the trees. Optically what happens when a bright light is behind a tree to the edges of the image of the tree in real time and space versus a digital overlay versus an optical overlay making maps and there's a lot of issues sometimes they're just flat out obvious but because it's obvious that there's something wrong with that different than it's not the typical kind of thing that we have in the database it's not the typical kind of thing we've seen before we have to define what it is what it isn't, how the object is illuminated and positioned and the relationship of the edges to each other and the rest of the field. This is a, a glass lamp top, merely internally illuminated by Bill Hamilton and others at MUFON in Orange County to just see how long it would take from the time that I first looked at the image, which Bill said, as soon as you get the image, call me. So they could start their watches running. <laughs> to take me a while? Did I say something right away subjective or something right away objective? It took about 10 minutes to define mathematically <coughs> why we believed it was a 18 to 20 inch object internally illuminated and to get a concept for them of what we thought it was of what illuminated here the side is lit up the rest isn't would any of you looked at that and thought that was a real flying machine everybody kind of could tell right Okay, but why? What would you say? How would you know? You've got to say something. What is it? Ah, this machine. Saw a lot of these. How many people know what that is? Everyone? Just a few? <coughs> Not everybody? Because you don't know what's been missing. This is a classic 
of a hoax done by a one-armed farmer in Switzerland that rides his bicycle out with a camera stuck on infinity that he can't adjust and goes out by himself as people up on the hill watch him and he trots out, goes and meets him and takes the pictures and comes back and uh, they go with him and turn in the film and process it and it's been proven to be a hoax. You all knew that, right? Yes, it's been proven to be a hoax by Cal Corf. Proved it to be a hoax. Not. Not one scientific paper was ever published on the methods used to prove that the Meyer case is a hoax. Michael Malin, JPL, this guy, that guy, Lawrence Lepley, test, quotes, reports, demonstrations of what they did was not enough. They missed it. This guy with an Amiga and the uh, mystery group, Bill Moore, some others working together, prove it the Meyer case was a hoax, and it became truth. And it was republished, and then it was republished and republished. It's now in the world's greatest UFO hoaxes as the king of the mountain. Based on what? Rumors. Lying. It makes me like not want to know you people. <laughs> well, not you people, I'm saying. <laughs> Sorry. The UFO community. Uh, the Spanish Inquisition, you can just see some of these people with those, remember those black hats on that opened up at the top and they were up there saying, she burned her at the stake because she made mulligan stew too quickly. <laughs> the Meyer case was really interesting because a one-armed farmer had hundreds of pictures that he willingly provided the negatives of in his film and his metal samples, which like we had done before, we went to the top people we could find. That's important, the top people we could find. Because as if claimed later, Wendell Stevens, Lee Elders, Billy Meyer, and Jim Delatoso were part of a major hoax to create this lie and turn it into a media project. God, we must be really good. If we can hoax something that we can convince some of the top people in the field that we have analyzed it, there's no evidence of a hoax, pretty good. Well, we're not like that. But we'll get back to that case in a minute. Many other cases, similarities we would find, uh, separated by years and years, and we begin to find interesting relationships in ratios. Nothing else. Guys made a mistake over here in Australia. Guys made a mistake in Borneo, separated by 25 years of taking pictures of things that are all but identical aspect ratio. The ratio of the height to the length. To the ratio of when does it kind of peel off and start to look like a cigar? When the picture's moving, and we have kind of a fuzzy edge out to there and kind of a fuzzy edge out to there and kind of fuzzy down to there. Okay, let's measure fuzzy to fuzzy. Fuzzy logic. Let's measure sharp to sharp to sharp. There's a lot of information in out of focus pictures. You take a picture of a bright light. When it goes out of focus, it looks like Batman wings frequently. And there's all kinds of little information inside of that. So we look at that too. The aspect ratio became an important thing in the data, just the coincidences of a way of categorizing. We get fireballs, we get weird daylight still things, we get orbs. You think you got orbs? <laughs> we get orbs. First and foremost, the principles of photogrammetric analysis and how do you use the most fundamental equipment to get numbers out of a picture to say it's this big and this far away. Study that first. As photogrammetric analysis uh, developed, 
an understanding of the edges became a real key thing. We started chasing edges and light properties. Now let's hang on the light properties for a second. Light. Can you make it brighter in here, please? Can you make it? I'd like to have a little amber light over there. And I'd like to have a little green light over there. Green light. Oh, but wait a minute. Isn't that fluorescent light a little green? Isn't that light a little amber? What does it take to know how much green and how much amber? The color composition of light. Uh, counting pixels became important. Contour of things, duration of how long an event happened, and the relationship known as sigma delta modulation. Sigma is a single number that is the mean, like the population center of the United States, is in, you know, East Osborne, Kansas, where nobody lives. The average mean generally is a spot where there isn't really anything, but it's the average mean of the amount of brightness, the amount of a certain color, the amount of deviation, all as a ratio becomes a single number known as the sigma. The delta is a change. We've got one picture, we've got a sigma. We've got a bunch of data, brightness, color, edge properties, all kinds of things. In moving video, if we have one frame, that's a sigma. But what you really want is a sigma delta. The change from one to another to another, because it can tell you all kinds of things. Like 3D stereo information. Like, is it flickering or not? Light, is it moving or not? Or is the camera moving? Bright lights. Start with some bright lights and we're going to do some things to it. We're going to start with the light. And after we use telepathic powers to get it into the computer. Oh no, sc scanner, scanner. <laughs> Digital camera, analog camera, frame grabber, scanners, a number of different ways. You all do it now. This is an example of across one line the amount of red, green, and blue information in every pixel on this is there, point zero, this is there. So we could break it up into 1,000 units, 10,000 units. This isn't in pixels yet. It's just an arbitrary scale. Now, travel across it to find the amount of red, green, and blue at every pixel along the way and go through the entire picture and do that. Get a huge table of just the brightness, the histogram, first pass. Well then, say, okay, we got all the red, green, and blue there. Let's take the blue and we want to see the mean. The average of the blue, if it was a straight line. The deviation, the average deviation from the mean. The x and y axis. Various data, because we're going to store it all. Not only use it for doing image processing and subtraction and analysis and filters later, but we're going to use it to see if it's moving or changing. So the beginning point, that's what it's essentially about. You want to understand that? Because it's kind of an important thing. If you could draw a graph have a dial over there to turn on the dining room chandelier and we give you a piece of chalk and say it's dark and as the light comes up we want you to draw a graph okay and when it's on just keep walking until we turn it off and then you draw it off that's what this is doing with precise color separation in the red, green, and blue domain, because that's where a computer and video works. Remember, RGB guns, red, green, and blue. Printing, mix and paint, a little different. What's that called? Anyone know? You've heard it before. Cyan, magenta. yellow, magenta, black. Cyma, sometimes it's called a Cymac. Oh no, that sounds like Sigma. What if a rookie over there 
is eavesdropping, and here's people talking about doing the sigma test, the sigma test, the sigma test, and is reporting to his astronomer friends that these people were doing some kind of spectrum analysis sigma test. First of all, an astronomer is doing a different kind of spectrum analysis. These kind of communication problems not only exist, but many of them are still unresolved. And what do the words mean? What does it mean when you're doing a histogram analysis of unknowns? Forget about these numbers for a minute. Just look at that, and then look at that. Do you think that this and that are out of the same piece of video, separated by a little period of time? No. Could be, but no, probably not, because there's a couple points where they're different enough. Yeah, you're right. No, they're not. Um, I skipped one. Lots of airplanes. Airplane lights, afterburner, helicopter lights, all kinds of lights. We got lights. There's their histogram. Flares. We got all kinds of flares. Thousands of flare pictures, because thousands of flare pictures are published by the manufacturer as part of the specifications. Brightness, wavelength, cetera. duration on and off time. We also did a lot of our own by going to the Barry Goldwater grounds and other places with flares manufacturing experts and same people that had shot unknowns that were alleged to be flares. Same people, same cameras, shooting flares with experts. Compare them. Sometimes you've got to go to a, a lot of extra effort when you'd rather be doing something else. Just because a naysayer won't let up. <laughs> and frequently they don't let up. Hale Bopp was out during March 1997 when the Phoenix Lights happened. A lot of people were out looking at Phoenix, uh, looking at Hale Bob. More people than usual were out. In fact, astronomy classes at ASU were out on the roof that night of March 13th at 8.30 when these lights flew right over the airport. Whole class. Oh, that was weird. Must be some kind of test. They went in, they came back out, they went in, they came back out. Little did they know that the reason that they were seeing them again at about quarter of ten was because they had come down to Tucson for a little visit, reported by witnesses, turned around and gone back. Hale Bop was out that night. Something happened called the Phoenix Lights. We'll get to that in a minute. A little bit about measuring light. Now a little bit about measuring edges. Measuring edges. Now in real life, I mean, everyone here is in focus, right? I mean, in real life, everything is in focus. Focus changes when you put a lens or a camera there. And the lens and the f-stop, like a little pinhole, you know, the f-stop looks like an iris. You open and close it. The smaller it gets, the more bonus focus you get. Real tiny f-stop. In fact, for those of you that can't see very well, you know this, right? You wet your fingers, you push them together, make a little hole. Just like that. Look through that hole. It's a miracle! I can see the clock. I can tell what time it is from here. Well, that's the f-stop. There's the lens. There's the depth of field of how much is in focus. How much is in focus? So things that are in front of and things that are beyond the depth of field are not in focus. But they're in focus differently. Things that are in front of the depth of field are out of focus differently than things that are beyond the depth of field are out of focus. Walt Disney's team knows that. Doing animation, layers of glass. We're going to paint the close-up trees on a certain piece of glass a certain way, and then we're going to paint the mountains and the hills 
different ways, on different pieces of glass, in order to make it look like Bambi is really jumping through all that. Now, for those of you who paint, he doesn't even use paint by number yet. Okay? <laughs> Come on, you can admit it. Anyone ever done it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. Yeah. You're the only people I've ever told that, okay? So <laughs> no talking about that. Paint by number kit. Fill in the blanks. How about a real painter? A couple of real painters in here, yes. Could you help us all, please? We, we'd like to know what you would do if we gave you a canvas about this big and we said, we want you to uh, trace that clock, make two circles here, and we want you to paint this circle so that it looks like a basketball at about you know, right that distance, and we want you to paint this one so that it looks like the moon real far away. What might you advise us to do? Shadows are real good, right? That always works. Mm, I got, you know, you're right about that, but it's not allowed, okay, in this situation. In this situation, first thing that you do, change the properties of the edges. As the Renaissance School of Painting and the guilds had some of their secrets about once you do that, Little we'll dips over here with one hair. You're going to dip in it and you're just going to barely touch it. And you're going to make that one able to look like a Renaissance stone ball, okay? That big, that far away. And this is the moon. We're going to do some things to the edges. Well, what if the guy doesn't have any glasses on? Okay, and he can't really tell the difference. What else are you going to do to it? We'll get to that in a minute. Picture can have the edges extracted out, and there's a lot of filters of ways to do that. Even Photoshop has a whole slew of really good ones that a long time ago cost a lot of money. <laughs> now they're right in there. But being able to convert a picture to a line drawing is one thing. All the data that's in there is another thing. And computers are very useful for that, for being able to really look at every little edge and say, hey, wait a minute. That edge looks like it's got a little purple in it. That edge doesn't look like it has any purple in it, but that one does. What does that mean? Does it mean anything? Maybe. Maybe it helps us know the direction that the light is coming from on the subject, maybe. Maybe it tells us Something about its skin tone, the light on that. Maybe this, maybe this, maybe this. Propose a hypothesis. Propose tests that you can do to seek what it means. Gather that data, put it all in place, and use it as a business. We turned it into a business. Movie colorizing. American Film Company won the contract in the 80s to convert black and white movies into color is a combination of edge detection and a paint-by-number kit. Of course, sometimes all the edges weren't filled in all the way. So you had to have other layers of ways of filling it in. Sometimes it looked like a cartoon because it made it all one color. And it's not really all one color. In real life, it's all one color, but because of the lighting, it's divided into segments along edges, like longitude and latitude, that help us predict information about an object based on its edges and its grayscale. So if we're going to make an object look like uh, a basketball and one look like the moon, we might change the number of segments that are in our paint by number kit. That the smaller you want an object to be, the fewer the number of segments you have. The larger you want the object to look like it is, the larger the number of segments. Therefore, the larger the number of shades 
of a certain color combined with the properties of the edges define first general rules that the cruise missile uses when it's going along to see if that's a tennis ball coming at it or the thing it's supposed to blow up. CAD. We're going to make an airplane. We want it to look like it's 22 feet or 48 feet. You don't just scale it up. You've got to add more segments. That's what's happening when you're changing the diameter. You're not just blowing it up like blowing up a picture. Changing more than one thing. In the vector, vector domain. effects guy I told you about, Wally Gentleman. He made that for them. Nobody told me that when they came back with the new Billy Meyer pictures for me to test that, oh, what they were that? These were the new Billy Meyer pictures. Oh, and did I mention that they were set up to embarrass me because they had a documentary film crew there to cover my results? And it uh, takes about 10 to 50 minutes. It's 52 and a quarter minutes, depending on your processing speed, uh, to determine that it's a scale model. Some things are almost so obvious that we don't even have to measure it. And that looks, see how it looks kind of all like it's one color? You know, smaller number of segments. Whereas this one's got, you know, all kinds of things going on. It's got highlights and it's got, it's got a patina, okay? Well, can tell. I can tell, you can tell. You can take a picture, it's not scientific, but it's good enough for you to find out more. Scan it in, get a picture, take it into Photoshop. Use one of the filters for contour color contour or edge detection or you'll find the one that you like and move them around. Do it on a little model airplane. Photograph, Google, toy airplane, Google TWA airplane. Do that to them. You'll see that. Just like a painter can see that and knows how to do that. You know, if we, if we would have taken a few painting classes, we could have saved ourselves 10, 15 years. <coughs> stuff. Position, motion analysis, are we moving, are they moving? Is the, what's going on with position and moving? Now that's a harder one. It's a harder one. So let's use the Phoenix lights, which you're all somewhat familiar with, just as an example of a couple things. Get done. Go through first thing, you know, extract all the light properties out of the entire picture, including the lights in the city and the unknown lights, basically every light. Do a histogram, separate them into objects, count them, their number of pixels, their brightness level, the edge properties. Man, fortunately we had some clients for supercomputers so we could kind of hone in on using supercomputer time. Oh no, that was our supercomputer. Well, Nonetheless, we had the availability to shorten processing time considerably and apply software, some of which was very, very remarkable because it's used in realistic, photorealistic rendering, making CAD images look real. I'll get back to that in a second. Hold that thought. You've been doing it all day. Hold the thought, so I'm counting on you all. Keep doing what you're doing. We're going to do a database comparison of other lights, other knowns, other flares. We're going to do some vector modeling, sometimes called triangulation. Let's do triangulation. We'll know how big it is and how far. Yeah, you show me where they do that without fail every time. There's a lot involved in that. There's a lot involved in all of this. I don't want you to think that uh, I'm trying to discourage you from doing it because I'm encouraging you to do it. I say there's a lot involved. If we were able to start now with the technology that exists today, the hardware and software that exists today, take people that have a moderate computer 
understanding, a little bit of Photoshop and editing. You can get the gear to do this for a couple grand. Software costs a bunch more, but train someone how to do it in, well, less time than it takes to go to hairdressing school. I mean, nothing wrong with hairdressing school. It's really great, but it takes 1,800 hours you know, to get a, a cosmetology license. You can learn to fly an airplane in, what, 40 hours, 100 hours? You can learn to do image processing, image analysis, as happens even at Apollo College, teaching people to read MRIs. You go a couple semesters, you're in, you got a job. It's doable now to analyze things following a procedure that's repeatable over and over and over again. Phoenix Lights, you all have seen this frame before, one frame out of a two and a half minute long movie that we were using the tools at the time that we were working on. We had, all, we had our various UFO paranormal related software and hardware. We had our normal uh, day at work, movie colorizing, rendering tools. And then we had our projects that we were working on for contractors uh, that we were doing. And uh, I'd use them. I forgot one thing. Remember that uh, secret handshake agreement, uh, agreement non-disclosure agreement that I talked about earlier that you sign all the time and you, know, you don't talk? We forgot that the spectral analysis software program that we are working on as one of the contractors was confidential. And that when we used it to analyze some pictures and all of a sudden news people were coming in and up on the screen was the menu for doing analysis and it says spectrum and I'm like, well, uh, well, yeah, uh, think of it as RGB. Think of it as like audio spectrum analysis. I'm trying to minimize it. I'm trying to explain it away. Cat was out of the bag. We had many, many images that were out where we were doing what was called multivariant hyper spectral analysis. Spectral analysis for short. And a number of people said we were liars. You cannot do spectrum or spectral analysis on a photograph or on video. That's for astronomers and others. In fact, a widely circulated yellow paper that was done about the Phoenix Lights pointed out, quoted a professor that said, us claiming to do spectrum analysis of film or video was like trying to extract Lincoln's DNA out of a White House oil painting of DNA. That's the quote. And it was hard to live with the five or so year plus years of ridicule you can't do that. It's a lie. It's a fake. It's a fraud. It's flares. And you in no way proved that it was anything other than a fabrication that you all did because you cannot do spectrum analysis. It's all heebie-jeebie. Fortunately, the uh, Department of Defense decided in 2001 to make public the existence of the hyperspectral hyperspectral, more than one spectral <laughs> at a time. Not only are we doing one spectral, we're doing more than one. Multiple variable analysis so that it could now be used for things like biometric analysis, people's faces, other software, other things, and the cat was let out of the bag. And on the FBI, U.S. Department of Justice website showing up in 2000, was advances in document examination, the video spectral comparator, 2000. This is on the website to this day. The FBI Laboratory of Forensic Audio and Video in their 75-page manual on how to build a forensic lab has over 20 pages devoted to spectrum, spectral, hyperspectral analysis. IEEE paper in March of 2005, full spectrum, spectral, imaging system analytical model. Everybody does it now. Mm -hmm. That's out at state of the art. Th in fact, there are even papers published companion on how to recalibrate 
the data that came out of the camera CCD chip based because each chip, red, green, and blue in a camera, or each layer, it's a single chip, has its own way that it interprets the red, green, and blue data, and you have to normalize for that. Published papers about it now, over 200. Any discussions about whether or not the Phoenix lights might not be flares because the tests that were applied to it, it's a valid testing, not a zero. I've sent out papers, I've sent out white papers, I've sent out procedural things all about this. It's like, oops, sorry, we don't behave like that in this scientific world of making apologies, or even more important, understanding it and using it. Anyhow, that's the last. I'm going to end all my pissing and moaning now. It hasn't been that bad, has it? Okay. Fundamentally, testing the Moon Valley witness number two image, just a quick example of a sigma. Remember, one frame. Take red, green, and blue, mean, deviation, et cetera, et cetera, come up with a single number. That's a number with a lot of decimals after it. Store it. But just look at the graph for now. Remember before we looked at the graph of the two challenges? <laughs> Jet airplane, hill bop, okay? Now we're looking at, come right down to the nut cutting. The unknown and flares. Sigma, well you can tell right away. But, what about the second frame, the third frame, the fifth frame, the thousand frame, 30 frames a second? 1,800 frames a minute? Two and a half minutes, that's a lot of frames. How many frames do you have to test to have done enough? 10, 100, how about all of them? Tedious. Generally speaking, every frame of every light was so close that if you superimpose a few hundred of those frames on top of each other, it looks pretty much like a little thicker version of this. Superimpose a hundred flares images, it's a mess. Moment to moment, they're changing, they're flickering, their brightness is changing, they're getting brighter, they're getting dimmer. Remember you were doing that chalk thing before? Light goes on, start drawing, and when the light stays on, just keep it going until we turn off. That's what it means if you overlay hundreds of them and they're the same. Whereas this is a light show, brighter, darker, you know, when a kid's playing with the chandelier light. Let's look at them over time. Delta. One minute, two minutes, final. This is generally the averages. So we've got this little measurement of our unknowns in the field the software we're talking about it's always called the AOI the area of interest area of primary interest the unknown the thing you're targeting is called an AOI brightness over time looks like someone went click 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 it was so interesting that even if there was just one or two or five that were so deliberate, it was interesting at the beginning. When the flares thing came up later and we started looking at flares and found that just one light over time, just one flare light over time is doing this where the AOI is doing this until it goes off. Well, it goes off by like kind of going down, right? We showed this to some other investigators, as you're supposed to, as we willingly do. And his position was he thought that it was flares going behind the mountain and he was going to do a test to prove it. I think if something was going behind the mountain, 
it wouldn't go eh, eh, as it got right on that edge, right on that edge. And they're back there, and they're looking up at you with that camera 12 miles away going, okay, we're going we're gonna to get them. <laughs> that last, we're going to go click, click, click. Okay, let's, let's let them have their way with us. That it's flares and it's blowing at some angle that makes it look like that when it goes behind the mountain. Hey, what about that? Is that when it came up from behind the mountain? <laughs> Yeah. So we looked at a lot of frames of video. With that. The witnesses said that they knew from looking out day after day in the daylight and where that was, that they knew that it was in front of a particular mountain, which was in front of the missile range, which on this map was way down here, which in a early MUFON newsletter was saying, yeah, it's behind the mountain, it's the Goldwater Range. So we did some modeling using Maya, Wavefront had just become Maya, using Maya, which is a CAD program to do rendering of animation photorealistically, you can set the brightness, you can create the object, so we made a model. Let's go sit on their houses. Let's position these lights down at the Goldwater Range, crank them up to the known brightness and lumens that the manufacturers publish and say that they do, and see if we can see them in our camera point of view model. Couldn't see anything. It was not only not bright enough after, does anyone know what the deceivist factor is? It's the curvature of the Earth. Boats, 26 miles at sea, you can see the horizon. If it's further than that, it fell off the flat earth. So, not only is there a brightness factor and an atmospheric factor, there's a flat earth factor of being able to see it. We couldn't see how it could possibly be that, but in gathering and interpreting the data, we were going to come up with another way to come up with accurate positioning. Here's this witness, Chuck Reardon, Dr. Lynn Keitai, back then known as Dr. X, uh, Sue and Mike Kristen, Tom King with uh, Bill Hamilton, a guy named Sonny, and another guy named Dewar. And we had video from all of them. They all had wildly different time and date stamps on them. Some of them said like, you know, year 1942, because they hadn't set their clocks right. Some of them had the time wrong in their minds, but a couple of them had television on in the background, which we could hear and synchronize to, regardless of when they say they shot it or the time and date stamp says they shot it, and begin to figure out where they might be. This is from Mike Kristen's house. This is one mountain. That's the other end of South Mountain. This is another mountain line of the Estrella Mountains that are 14 miles beyond that with the Salt River Gila Reservation back in there, which now has the Wild Horse Pass Casino sitting right there. Mike says that they're in front of the front of the mountain, uh, in front of this mountain at ridge line, or in front of that mountain, but in front of the mountain, not up above the mountain. Other analysis was pointing out that it had to be the Goldwater Range down here because they drop flares there all the time. No one came forward the following day, the following week, the following month, all that news that was out there and said, well, yeah, it was flares. We, we did it that night. <laughs> months later, <laughs> months later, public information officer of the Arizona National Guard said, you know what? The Russians flew in a stolen MiG-25 
undetected by radar, flew right through Phoenix and bombed Phoenix and no one knew. Wasn't on radar, it's the same thing that was being said. Wasn't on radar, we didn't know what it was, we asked everybody, no one knew what it was. The equivalent is a foreign person flew a foreign airplane undetected right through the city and dropped bombs, flares, and got out and was missing, didn't admit it. Well, news organizations reported it. It's been shown, it's flares, it's all flares. Let's model that. How are we going to model that? This is a really neat program. We use a download program. The 30-day trial of Photo Modeler 3 is amazing. You take two pictures, three if you got them, five if you got them, of anything. How about of an old house? And you shoot from that angle and that angle or multiple angles. You go into the software and you bring it up and it does good old edge tracing. And now says, uh, let me ask you a couple questions. This lights up. It says, let me ask you, uh, where is that over here? So you click on that. Where is that over here? Click on that or it's out of range. You go through and the more angles you have and the more dots you can connect, the more information it has to create a 3D CAD wireframe model. And Photo Modeler 3 is a very, very advanced program for what it used to take to do this. And uh, once we discovered this, the you know, seven, eight thousand dollar version that we had been using to do things like this before was no longer upgraded. <laughs> and uh, really can show you some amazing information about where something is or what the model is. If you can position it with GPS accuracy. Well, if you're going to do that, let's go get some maps. So let's go to U.S. Geological Survey. They had good maps. Lots of other people have maps from Keystone to Smart to all kinds of people have maps. But these are all free and they pretty much overlay with each other and Google uses them and a lot of other people use them. Back then, we didn't really have a Google mapping. But, so what we did was we got topographical maps, we got photographic maps from Landis, we got closer detail relief maps, we got really good vector maps in wireframe fashion created by satellite that flies over, takes thousands of pictures, stereo to create a 3D relief map by stereo photogrammetric makes it available if you want to have the texture map of real photographs that have been taken they're going to be wrapped on it like saran wrap and make a real picture you can do that so we did that so we had the whole valley hey, channel 3 has that now as a button push on the weather isn't it cool and fly around look at the valleys and all that or Tucson has it what's going on with the weather back then it wasn't quite as easy to be able to navigate in 3D around the state in the valley but after downloading all of our maps and having them ready to position our data on top of and doing our vector modeling by going to the GPS position of the person who shot the video from Dr. X, Chuck Reardon, Mike Kristen, and using Photo Modeler to model their images store them in the database, match up the audio in the background, the newscasts that are on, you get a probability walkway of where it could be. Could be here, can't be there, could be here, could be here, could be here, most likely there, can't be there, can't be there. A probability zone. There's a few things we don't know, you know, exact, like, you know, was the tripod set up here, or was it set up over here? You can move one or two degrees 
it's okay for a certain distance, but you know, you move one degree and go to the moon, you missed it and hit Jupiter, <laughs> you know? It's true. So what we're trying to do is determine first, you know, how far away is it? Can we figure out from where everybody is, how far away is it? How far are we throwing the ball? So once we get how far away it is, I mean, the program does a lot of this by itself, like doing an Excel spreadsheet. And we put in some of the basic data and then say, run it out for 65 years. And you go out for dinner and you come back and there it all is. And you punch a button and it turns into a graph and you look at it various ways that it's interpreted the data for you. We count on that to give us a belt of proximity of where it most likely has to be. And we get this aerial view beltway of most likely where it has to be. And what a coincidence, it superimposes right on top with the line of all the witnesses from 8 o'clock, 8 o'clock to 8.15 to 8.30 to 8.45 to 9.30 to 9.45 to 10 o'clock to 10.15 to 10.30 of its maneuvering through the entire state and Peter Davenport's database and MUFON's database and our database says this is a chart showing where all the witnesses were when they gave their report. Not what time, just where were they, approximately what time. It's a pathway. And if you say we had a witness here, we have a witness here, and there's the time. Wow, look at this probability vector convergence hits right along that. It's not proof, it's another signal of the probability that it's correct. So for us, we had done the appropriate things to determine that it was positioned in a place very far away from the flare zone for 10 o'clock. By the way, the public information officer at Davis Monthan said the Maryland National Guard had landed by 8.30. A little detail that people forgot to swap amongst each other when they were working out their story. Good story. But not flares because of optical analysis, multivariant hyperspectral analysis, commonly known as fast Fourier transforms, FFTs, the olden days, are you interested in that? Pattern recognition. And uh, for us, we knew. We knew we knew what we knew. Here's where they are, and they're not flares. So it's not up to us to convince the world. But we did our homework. Yes, sir, Mr. Jim. Did you, did you determine that their lights were individually? That's a good question. We determined that, first of all, in some very specific motion tests that relative, let's see if I have it, uh, relative to each other, this is the old slide sorter, for those of you interested, um, okay here we go, let's look at this one. This is one frame out of, we did about 1,200 frames of this. This is the Mike Kristen most noted video where the lights were like in a half circle and there's one over here. So, light one, two, three, four, five, six, lights A, B, C, D, E, da, da, da. You connect the dots. You build a massive spider diagram, a giant polygon of connecting this light's relationship to that one, to that one, to that one, to that one, this one, to that one, this one, to that one, this one, to that one, and you have its length in pixels or length in ratios from one to another because if the camera's zooming in and out, the number of pixels is going to change, but the ratio of one to the other, whether it's zooming in and out, will remain constant. So we had to do both. Point of story, these things are locked. 
they are not moving relative to each other, let alone going down behind the mountain. Now, some police chasing labs did uh, or insurance accident, you know, recreation companies. Nothing wrong with that. We've done that. But when you're paid by a documentary company to do analysis on the Phoenix Lights, and they do it, and they analyze and demonstrate that this is the facts. See the lights? They go behind the mountain. Well, one of the things that they missed on was that there's a little tree here that in doing various levels of filter enhancement to get the right level where the edges of the tree stick out. Enough to say that there's a little tree there with this far light is on that side of that tree. In that Cognitech analysis, if any of you might have seen it, the light's on the wrong side of the tree. I mean, it was lined up enough that, you know, it kind of makes sense from here. But when you go over there, it's way off. It was not done in an appropriate way, but again, it was believed as proof that it's flares falling behind the mountain. You can do this yourself. Try this at home, okay? Try this at home. Measure one, two, five of them. And uh, sometimes witnesses claimed that they saw the object going overhead at a very slow speed, sunny slope in Phoenix, and the doctor and his wife and child in a car from Tucson head to Phoenix at about Gila Bend. So it went over very, very slowly. You see it coming for a long time. It almost floated. They could look up and see inside of the light, like looking up in a canister, it was explained, as the canister literally turned into an orb, described as an orb, not a light, a Chinese lantern, a ball and disconnected and flew off at high speed in the direction that we would say is towards Fountain Hills. We say it appropriately towards Fountain Hills because there were witnesses who said that at approximately that same time they saw independent lights up in Fountain Hills and that's all they saw. Corroboration, another dot on the uh, taxonomy, another graph. A uh, lot of witness data, a lot of measurements, not as much video as we would like to have seen, and only one person that claimed to have been contacted or abducted. It was interesting. Lots of cases where there's 10 or 100 or more witnesses there's half that many that say that they were visited in their dreams or abducted or something. And I believe many of them were. Yes? Is your original database name, have you been able to, uh, and, and all that original information that you started back in Intact. It's remained intact. Okay. And the formats have had to be changed as time has gone on. But uh, fortunately, even DBase 3 and DBase 4, Turbo Pascal and other formats that evolved made it so that pretty much everything that's simulation driven and database driven is from the Excel data table algorithms and other uh, structured query language, SQL, 7, 8, all are able to migrate the data which is rows and columns. But uh, since we don't do it as a quote business, it's not something that we have, you know, manuals and set up and ready to go and define on what it is and how it works on a moment's notice. But uh, I've provided copies to others. Uh, we had, um, we've had a number of interns over the years interning in computer graphics, animation, rendering, supercomputer stuff, principally from ASU. But uh, two guys in particular from Germany um, worked uh, at Mental Ray software company for rendering. That's a rendering uh, package like RenderMan. And they did some work in um, uh, optimizing the table to be directly connected to a media cybernetics brand forensic analysis software package called Image Pro Plus, which most of the entire industry uses. We do too. Um, 
so that the data tables and the software utilities in Image Pro are plugins. So that as you do tests of certain things, if it recognizes a certain sequence, it'll take the data and automatically create that graph and that spreadsheet for you. What would you suggest, what would be ideal for somebody like you who does analysis? You said, you know, I, I get, gather that when somebody's zooming in or zooming out or moving yeah. positions, that's going to make your job more difficult. So if somebody actually saw something and had a video camera and started filming it, what would be the ideal for you to be able to do the best analysis okay. you have to do as a camera? The ideal for me is for you to have an ideal experience. If people are out shooting these things that are mistakes or accidents or it's people from another zone, hey, it's for you. It's not for me. I like that you asked the question. I like it when people have the autofocus off and they get it in focus because bright lights in the sky, doesn't know what to do, goes in and out, in and out of focus. Go on a reference object once and then stop, you know, try to Get as close as you can, but if it's moving, it's hard to keep it in frame. Uh, lights at night, you know, it's not my favorite thing. I've got a lot of lights at night. When there's uh, um, more lights at night, more witnesses, more of that, uh, it's not my job to chase them down and test them. In fact, I generally don't work with the witnesses themselves. Other investigators bring me the stuff. If they ask me to, I work on it and provide them the results. I don't publish it unless they say to. Then it gets back to the witness. For you to do it, it's uh, take the autofocus off. I stay as you know, close in as you can. But there's not a whole lot new that's going to come out of lights at night. Well, unless. City, uh, solar one, yeah, those are cool. Yeah, those are daylight. Um, if I viewed it as taxonomy of the whole field and what else we needed to know about it, it starts to fall out that we know, pretty, we know pretty much everything we're going to know right now by testing pictures. The testing pictures is for people that have had an experience to feel comfortable in the fact that they can talk about it or go somewhere or see that someone else has had the pictures tested and that's what it's become that it's about. So you, after that and experiencing that and knowing that and looking at all the data and looking at all the shape files and all that stuff has been talked about and what's thrown away and what's kept, it's about, believe it or not, the contactees. Not the guy that knows the guy that supposedly saw the bodies. The guy that took a picture of a daylight thing or even a nightlight thing. I had an idea. Let's all get cameras. And let's go up to the highest building in Tucson. We'll all take a different direction and we'll take pictures of all the cars. You know, going to work, doing what they're doing, and we'll study them with supercomputers. And at the end of that, We'll know everything about the people driving them, right? No, we'll know nothing. Let's we'll know how to concentrate. They're going to be over there. They're going to be over there. Uh, my personal view is that as time has gone on, I, I came to understand what I wanted to get out of understanding about testing and analyzing pictures. I came to then understand that kind of about people feeling like if they see something or take pictures that they can go somewhere because they don't have to keep it a secret and maybe they won't be ridiculed but you know there's a, there's a, there's a, a freedom to most likely not be ridiculed they might lie about you or snicker about you behind your back and call you crazy but no longer to your face you know, you all can walk proudly up and down the street without fear of ridicule. 
You know, and it's, it's, a lot has happened, you know, in the last five years, ten years, it's almost become in vogue, you know, to be interested in the topic, isn't it? It's kind of cool. But in the end, it's about what do you tell your grandma that's the truth before she dies, and what are you telling your kids? What do you think Philip Class tells, used to tell his grandkids about whether it's true or not, you know? But for me, it's become about the contactees, particularly contactees that might have taken pictures or done something else because that leads to the point of what did they say that they said, you know? And you got a thousand people that you interview and 500 of them made a mistake and 200 of them are lying and 200 of them are, are well, you know, not psychotic but maybe neurotic, <laughs> you know? And 99 are lying. It only takes one, one guy, one girl, one woman that really met him to wipe out all prior data done from afar about who they are and why they're coming here. So for me, I like the contactee cases that Wendell has steered to me. Not that he hasn't steered me a waterfall of pictures to analyze and look at, but the contactees. Billy Meyer case, I find no evidence of a hoax. Some things are pretty fishy sometimes about why, he, hey, remember the story about Billy Meyer making a model and that Cal Korf caught him? He made the model and his group made the model. What do you mean he found pictures of the model? Everybody, for example. Yeah, this Jim. <laughs> I know, it looks weird, doesn't it? All right, now, I always have considered that what I heard in one little thing a long time ago about the beam ship was true. And that's at the top, telescopes up and down, that thing moves, it comes up and turns, and we did a little animation to that. I was told that that is the top off of the ship and that it can get down to little if it needs to be and that it can go bigger if it needs to be. Scientifically, Wendell tracked down Navy acoustics guy Robin Shellman who ran the acoustics lab at Anti-Submarine Warfare Center who an had analyzed sounds for what they were compared to a database, didn't know what these sounds were supposed to be of the Meyer case and drew illustrated little balls orbiting and change, say that they're, this one would be resonating and they would be orbiting because of the phase modulation and the change. So hey, it looks weird to me if it's supposed to be, you know, a big object. I mean, it looks like small up close, but then some of the other ones look larger. Maybe it changes. Maybe it's like Billy Meyer said. Maybe I misinterpreted what he said because I like some things that are said out of it, so I overlook other things. But what I'm asking is, did you do the same photo analysis with the Whittington pictures as you did with, like, the variations? The first round, the first five, six years, we had four pictures. Four pictures. We took around to everybody. Wendell had gotten the negatives that were in Billy's camera, took them and had laser copy negatives made. Scanned, not flash copied. So we had two and a quarter and four by fives, I think. Yeah, uh, I'll say his 35 millimeter, which is what we took around to places, those four. So what can you tell out of these pictures? Which is the time we were finding out about edge properties, which is one of the main things back then, properties of edges in the secret societies of image processing. <laughs> and uh, those four. Dozens and dozens of other labs analyzed the pictures before I owned my own $80,000 computer and could analyze myself. It wasn't until the early 80s that I bought a Gould 9000. And then two De Anza computers and then others and others. So the initial tests were done by others. And the way those photographs were not part of it. Uh, subsequently, Others have tested copies of photographs of those photographs and claimed things that uh, indicate that they're a hoax. I haven't seen any measurements or any data scientifically that demonstrates 
that that is a hoax. It looks like a small object because maybe it is. Uh, some of the uh, communications organizations that have grown up around Billy Meyer have an unusual way of presenting his experiences, the legends of Billy Meyer, and defending or explaining the evidence. I'm not in that. You know, I don't participate, I'm not for it, or I'm not against it, I just state what I did. I uh, haven't tested the wedding cake pictures, uh, except to look at the fact that the digital pictures that I've looked at show that it's a uh, single light source illuminating it. So it's either the sun, it's outside, or it's light, it's not lit from inside. And it uh, shows to be uh, an object about four and a half to five feet of the one that's tipped up at an angle. And not the same edge properties as the one that's way off by the tree. The Christmas tree. Yeah, the one no, no. The one off in the distance is different, and the one where it's almost coming overhead with the tractor in front is different. Different to the degree that he's made three different models. If he's making models, if the little one is a model, uh, he made other models too. I can't speak for what he might have done. I can speak to if he's doing hoaxes and special effects, what it might cost to do that. How, how would you do it? Beams, beam splitter, overlay, this way, that way, make the model. How many people do you have to have helping you? What supplies do you need? And that's an interesting exercise that people that claim it's a hoax, I have yet to see one budget for it, or a bid. Uh, a lot of opinions, you know, I might have about certain things, but, uh, you know, I, I really have tended to try to stay nested in the data, the testing, what we did there, how others can do it, and then what I'm interested in and may believe is another thing, you know? Time. Oh, we are? I thought it was five, he said. That I was going to go, okay, I, I can wrap. I'm, I've finished going through these. Yes, the plan is to uh, take a break for just a couple minutes, stretch. We're going to set up an audio, and Wendell is going to talk to you about a case that is particularly interesting and fascinating to me because I met the guy, Richard Miller, who um, I met him 20 years ago with Wendell, who is a longtime friend of his, who during the military, became a contactee, was one of the early contactees, and started doing channeling sessions of extraterrestrials and recording them, but recording them with unusual other circumstances going on at the same time. And it's one of the half a dozen more inspirational, if, if nothing else, circumstances to me, and that's why I'd like you all to uh, stay and hear that. Okay. Light. Yes. You never did explain exactly the size of the ship. Then if all the lights stayed the same place, how big was it? Okay. Remember we have a bandwidth of possibilities, okay? In that given zone, it would have been between approximately 800 yards and 2,000 yards across, approximately, which fits kind of with what some of the witnesses said of how long it took to go overhead and get from one light to the next. But it's the 10 year anniversary coming up soon of that, so a lot of unusual coincidences about gamma radiation bursts, and Cl President Clinton fell and broke his knee that night and was sequestered underground, and we went to DEF CON 3, and satellites got knocked out. All these other coincidences that happened, even the Phoenix Lights was flares, those are very influential flares. <laughs> So it's uh, 3.15, what time do, do you want to leave here, four? Oh, four, okay. So it'll take us just a few minutes to get this plugged in and set up. Uh, well, thank you all for coming. I'm happy to talk with you. Thanks. Uh -huh.